you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of observing. And I think that's a talent that and a skill that we don't work on or we don't teach it or we don't, you know, put high value on it. So I think this talk is also part of observing and making sure that uh, when you do a site characterization, not only are you doing things like measuring and doing all the things the regulators uh, want you to do, but uh, it's also about observing and seeing um, what you have. Where, where you want to go, and maybe some things around you or people around you that can teach you something. So I think um, reclamation and restoration is something that has evolved over decades, and it's still evolving. And I agree that we can all learn from each other. Although I got to tell you, if we're going to have that kind of conversation that um, I think Elise wanted, maybe we need to do it at night over beer and wine instead of coffee and orange juice. <laughs> All right, so um, my mode of operation in presentations is usually to pack a lot into a PowerPoint. So if you miss something, uh, it's going to be recorded, and so don't worry about it. Uh, it will be um, available. So I'm going to try to go through this so that we leave some time for questions at the end. And so with that, we'll get going if I know how to do this forward thing. Okay, so I was given the task of talking about site characterization. And my first thought about that was that you really need to think in terms of, is it remediation or is it reclamation and restoration? Because in remediation, site characterization has a very definite uh, definition. And uh, they may have different uh, steps, and they have similar steps for different purposes. So. Um, this is something we've all seen in the news lately. I would not want to characterize that site, um, but that's what happens with the mediation site. Um, you need to uh, think in terms of is it an old site, is it a new site? Time becomes a, an immediate issue. Um, containment is important, and the, the thing I think of in North Dakota is all the brain spills uh, would be um, remediation. So. There's a reclamation aspect to it, but there's also a remediation aspect. So reclamation and restoration has a different perspective than remediation. Um, it's similar steps, uh, but I'm going to talk about new sites where time is generally more available and peace planning is paramount. So I think uh, lessons learned is a good phrase to walk away with today from the issue stuff. Um, planning. There's a huge word in my talk. So a little bit of planning goes a long way. You can never start worry. So some of the disturbances we think about, you know, are ones that we've been here historically for here at in Dickinson. Oil and gas, uh, mining, both underground and surface, pipelines, you know, there's pipeline issues, transmission lines, um, municipal projects have uh, a recognition of restoration aspects. And I put in this housing development picture because sometimes we don't think of how extensive housing divisions, subdivisions are on the land street. Those kind of things to where we live and work, but it takes up space and it has a disturbance aspect. So in my world, I'll probably talk more about site characterization as a baseline assessment or pre-assessment. We'll hear pre-assessment more. You need to be more proactive than reactive. I think uh, sometimes when blow and go, you know, the commodities have great prices, um, you forget about the food planning part, and you become more reactive. So again, food planning is uh, something you can do in advance. Um, so the type of data you need is going to vary by your, uh, it could be by a landowner if you're talking in terms of agricultural land. But more often than not, it's by state or federal regulations. There will be some local regulations coming to say, too. And uh, so, and then again, we're talking native or agriculture. So, when you do a pre assessment, I think of it as a, a jigsaw puzzle. And you have over on one side of the arrow, you have an area that you're going to disturb, and it could be um, an oil and gas pad, it could be a road. We forget how many acres are disturbed just based on roads, trying to get into a location, uh, pipelines out, 
So those memory disturbances you know, can add up to a lot of issues. But it's just a big puzzle. How do we make sense of it? And it depends on where you're at. So if you're at an active copper mine in Arizona, active coal mine in, you know, in Indonesia, or an oil and gas site in North Dakota, if you have any knowledge of all of those three areas, you kind of have a pretty good idea of what your challenges are going to be even going into that. So you need to understand those pieces of the puzzle. So we're going to take a little bit of a test here. We've got five seconds to look at that. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. The way it goes. So, what color was the full side of the Rubik's cube that was exposed? Oh, look at these guys. Oh, sorry. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Darn, you, you threw me. How many items were there? Maybe that's part of Eight. Is that true? Eight or nine. Let's count. I guess it depends, right? One, two, three. Nine. Nine if you don't count the price tag. Okay, so what was the dollar on the price tag? That's easy. And then how many handles did the cup have? One. Okay, so that's probably a good guess, right? Even if you didn't see that it only had one, you almost touched the test. One handle. Okay, so there you go. That's, um, that was a very simplified picture, right? So if you, if you would have increased that by 10 times the number of uh, items in there, it would have been a little more difficult. So most of us don't have a photographic memory over time. Uh, as I get older, I know that all the, all the more painfully. Uh, so you need to quantify what you see, what you have, before you disturb it. And one of the reasons why you do that is it can be tied to ongoing monitoring after reclamation. So a good definition I came up with was it's an initial set of critical observations or data with which to compare future observations or results or as a control. So somehow you need to quantify what you have before you disturb it. And part of that is to put it into your reclamation plan. It helps to do Seed mixes, it helps to identify weeds that may be present, to have a weed plan. Uh, do you have any sensitive plants that you need to worry about from a, from a federal level or a state level? And then establish that comparison area so you know how to compare your success later. Um, yeah. So some of the resources to consider, um, these are just part of the list. There's probably more than what I've listed here, but we'll go through those. Uh, what I've said here. So surface use, land ownership is a big deal. It is where I live, um, where you know half the surface it might be federal ground. Um, so what's there to begin with? Who's the ownership? All those things I've listed under um, as well as roads, blah blah blah. Um, you need to make sure you understand what's in the general vicinity of where you're going to be disturbing. And in our state, state grass, which is probably here too, is a big issue. So when it comes to wildlife habitat, how many existing disturbance areas do you already have before you even start new disturbance? Air quality, again, you got to know what to have, not only from, um, you know, just uh, gathering baseline information, but when you set emission standards, you're going to, so those are pretty much two sets that you can uh, negotiate or talk. Uh, if something already exceeds an emission standard that you are going to be under. People are a lot smarter than me can talk about air and water. So I listed in here uh, Clean Water Act. The other one is Clean Air Act. Clean Water Act is on surface and groundwater. Um, so if a state has primacy, that means they're going to need to exceed the requirements that the federal laws have for both of those acts. And then in terms of water quality, the DMS is perfect. So surface water might be things like springs, what's the flow rate, um, you know, uh, what's the channel uh, geography or geometry, um, surface water classification, all of those things need to be determined ahead of time. These are some of the things that you might uh, look at in terms of measuring ahead of time. Again, you're going to be under certain standards. You want to know what the baselines are because some of those parameters, you may already be at the limit um, that a standard may be because of this natural background. Groundwater, same kind of thing. 
uh, what's the depth of the groundwater, what's the quality of the groundwater, uh, what's the classification of the groundwater, what's the geology, um, and then if you're going to be uh, injecting anything, you have a capacity of any kind of geologic formation. So geology and groundwater are kind of fit together. Here are some of the uh, analytes you might think of in terms of groundwater. Again, it's not an uh, absolute risk. There's probably more. You need to understand your state requirements um, wherever you live. And then groundwater monitoring, these two pictures are from North Dakota. This is just a, kind of a look down at uh, view and then cross view of sea geology and groundwater that we have in the state. So from a soil standpoint, I think, and I'm biased, I am. Um, you know, my background is soils and beds. So I think that uh, what's underground is going to dictate what you get above ground. So you need to understand your soils in terms of erosion uh, capacity or capability as well as reclamation suitability. And we all know that over the course of a landscape, not all soils are equal. And between states, between regions, uh, we just heard from the ladies from Arizona. I can guarantee those, those soils are going to look different there than they do here in uh, very hot holes, country, and, and molecule. So this is my big thing. I think sometimes we get all mixed up in our terminology of what topsoil is. I think basically uh, people put a lot of words and phrases into there, but we all kind of know the concept, but sometimes I get stuck on, on actual words because from a taxonomic point of view, topsoil has a very defined uh, definition. So what kind of assessment, pre assessor do you need? It's going to depend on what industry you're in, it's going to depend on the size, and it's going to depend on if you're native or cropland. So some of the basic steps for soil work would be to gather all the pre-existing information you have. Don't reinvent the wheel. Map your soils into map units. You can use existing maps like the NRCS would have, but you need to understand the limitations of those maps at an order three level. You sample your map units, gather field information, send things to the lab if you have budget and money and time, um, and then well, how do you interpret those results for your uh, actual use? So mapping, again, don't reinvent the wheel. Make sure you know what's available. You might have other soil surveys, not only just NRCS, but you may have other soil surveys. Other companies have done work in that area. And I never poo-poo uh, anything that's old, because those uh, old surveys have a lot of information. Uh, we talk a lot about anecdotal stuff. There may be uh, things you can learn from old surveys. There's things you can learn from people that have done the work in that area before. So on the on the NRCS map, make sure you gather representative soil samples. Either you know, agriculture is going to be a little bit different. This is a native uh, piece of ground here. You have to sample enough samples in those uh, native areas to get a representative characterization of those of that quality. And then you can compile your own uh, draft soil map based on all those things that you've already done. Aerial photography is a great thing to use. Google Earth is a great thing to use if you need to uh, look at history of a particular area. Go back in that upper, I think it's the upper uh, left. Just look at what's happened in that area over time. Uh, it's, the history, again, is going to tell you maybe what you have to deal with. Uh, let's see. So I'm, I'm a firm believer of, of doing your own soil cores, your own soil pit, your own shovel work, if you can. Uh, if you're in the mountains or any steep country, like in the Badlands, road cuts or erosional features can give you a lot of information as to what your soils are. So you don't have to dig a hole. Don't do it. But uh, if, if nothing else, it's something that you can get to site-specific information. So the number of samples are going to vary based on whether it's native or agriculture, the size, the linear uh, width of your right of way. Um, so if anybody asks, I almost anticipate that somebody will say, well, how many samples did I take? And I'll sound like a lawyer, and I'm going to say it all depends. Uh, but those are some of the factors you need to understand. What's your purpose? 
what's the size, what regulatory limits are you under, and then uh, what's the variability in your landscape. So then these are a list of criteria that we use. Uh, this is a, the state suitability criteria in Wyoming for soil, uh, topsoil or topsoil substitutes. And you'll see it's divided into suitable, marginal, or unsuitable. I think it's interesting, as a side note, you'll notice texture has no unsuitable limit. But we all know what clay is like to feed into. But yet, it's pretty much uh, only listed in the marginal column. So compositing might be something you do on a on an ag field. Um, you can do it by depth and then locations, but I would still try to get a, an idea of what your soil map units are within that field, and then try to maybe do your compositing within those soil map units. Um, again, if you got the time and you got the money, I would try to do it by map unit. So uh, in an undisturbed area, um, and especially in and this would be like a native rangeland. If you can do it by horizon or similar horizons, you know, you can't sample every horizon because you don't have enough material to go to the lab. But uh, you, can, you can compile horizons um, as best as you can. Believe it or not, that picture does have topsoil in it. It just doesn't look too great, does it? Not tomato garden ground. And then where access is limited, you may have to do it by hand. You can do it by a uh, mechanical auger. Try to take as many notes in the field as you can in terms of, and your NRCS, your local guys can really help you on this. Uh, but I really feel like take as much information as you can. Half the time spent is getting out to a location. So when you're out there, make as many notes as you can. You don't want to have to go back. And then, Make sure you put your uh, sample locations down, document where those are at. You may have to go back. Uh, if you're going to composite, you may not want to do the exact same location. But um, you're going to try to keep track of where your low, those locations are. Profiles, this would be if you have a pit, you can kind of see where your horizons are, where your limiting plant horizons are. That's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to determine topical salvage depth. Uh, not everything is six inches. I know on pipelines a lot of times it's, everything is like take six inches and go with it, but it may be three. It could be 18. You don't know that until you do those, either a soil pick or uh, dig your own hole. And these are some things you might want to write down in the field uh, in terms of when you're at those locations, these things that will give you a better idea of what these salvage steps are. Uh, these are some uh, parameters you might analyze for. Uh, make sure you understand if you're an industry person. Um, make sure you understand what the state is requiring you to analyze for. If it's an ag situation, um, a lot of the labs will have packages that they'll um, have as cheaper packages uh, based on ag fertility or uh, some type of industrial suitability. And then the bottom line is you want to know what, how much you could take. You don't want to uh, take too much. You don't want to leave anything there that's going to get uh, basically driven on, impacted, ruined from a chemical or a physical standpoint. Let's get over that. So ultimately, you're trying to come up with some salvage depth and know how many yards of suitable material you have. So on the vegetation side, it's very similar. Um, you want to know what those communities are before you disturb an area. Um, establish a reference area so that you can compare after reclamation, you know, in terms of various parameters. But you need to know what's there and maybe an adjacent area that you could use as a reference uh, comparison area. Those are some parameters you might want to measure in terms of education, cover production, um, how much uh, pounds per acre you have. Density, uh, diversity, those type of things. Not everybody's going to have to do all of these. This is pretty much industry driven or purpose driven. Invasive species is a big thing too. Well, you want to know what you have there before you start disturbing, because you want to know what the problems are going to be afterwards. And weeds can definitely be an issue. Let's get over that. Um, so, uh, representative, so what needs to be monitored, I think, is, uh, I put this in here, even though it's not necessarily characterization, but 
you should monitor everything that you see there and then compare it back to that area that you established as a reference area. So you can have something to compare. Is it coming along? Is it trending? Um, am I getting the production I need? Am I getting the cover I need? Um, if you don't do that, it goes back to that puzzle that you have to rely on your own memory. And we just can't do that from a quantitative standpoint. So from a uh, ag standpoint, you might look at overall field averages, you know, look at the historical yields, identify those productive and less productive areas. Again, that probably goes back to soil types, um, but have a pretty good idea what your ag fields look like. And then on linear disturbances, it's really problematic because it goes over a full landscape and has a lot of different soil types. So note areas afterwards that you might see some compaction problems as well as subsidence problems. So one of the simplest things you can do is to photograph an area, go back to the same spot. If you have a recreational uh, grade GPS, that's better than, than anything, or not anything, but it's better than nothing. Um, go back to that same spot and just do a north, south, east, west photograph at that spot. Um, if you do monitor over different years, they'll go back in the same general time frame. Like if you always monitor the end of June, go back in that same general time frame. Don't go back like in the end of June and then go back to the end of August, uh, especially if you're on native range because your grasses are all skewered out and it won't be the same comparison. And then I've listed some things that you can compare uh, quantitatively. You can flood rats and transects. Um, so diversity, the only the point I want to highlight there is that when you measure diversity, that's really by a few established in wildlife habitat, that's going to be a real important thing in terms of uh, of that land use. Wetlands, you guys have you have the market on wetlands up here. So you got uh, lots of them. Um, you have your groundwater closer to the surface, depending on where you're at in the state. But these are some things that a Corps of Engineers has a pretty defined delineation program. You can look at National Wetland Inventory Map, Color Infrared Photography is the CIR, and that gives a really good idea. Photographs that were taken like the end of August, September, and anything green shows up red, so you can really see those late season wetlands. Other pre-assessment ones, like I said before, aerial imagery is really a huge thing in my mind. It's been around forever. Some of the best uh, use of photography I used um, to evaluate long-term issues was 1939, black and white. It was, in a, it was like in an NRCS office, somehow USDA, and um, I, I didn't even think they had, I imagine like Snoopy and the Red Baron, you know, where he was like leaning out the window with a, a brownie camera or something, but it really told the picture, even though it wasn't rectified at all for any kind of uh, face on the ground. So a lot of things from aerial imagery. Your database is a very huge thing. There's the power of the query, if you've ever heard that word, that is that is an important thing with RTIS. Is that you can query anything where our brains again aren't able to do as as efficient of a job as uh, putting in. Anybody know what query means? Everybody all familiar with that? No hands. So yeah. Um, you know, like, well, I'm not even going to give you an example, but the query, it's a really the power of the query for RTIS. So invest, investigate that as a possibility. North Dakota has lots and lots of resources from both a pre-assessment and a, a post-assessment standpoint. I've listed some there. Sorry, I didn't have time to put in the links to these, but uh, you can Google any of those and get those uh, publications. So in summary, uh, be observant. I'm going to add that one after Elise's talk because a lot of this is just being observant, knowing what you need to do and how to document these areas before you disturb them. Because that's important. You need to know what you got well ahead of when you disturb an area. Be proactive. Set it again. A little bit of planning goes a long way. Understand the dynamics of the biological system in which you're working. There is not a one size fits all, and unfortunately, regulations kind of tend to force us all into those uh, pigeonholes. Do your homework and talk to others because there's a lot of information out there, anecdotal as well as uh, research, as well as um, 
you know, white papers, there's a lot of information out there, and the idea is to uh, find those people who have maybe been there before. So this is something I've always uh, seen many, many times, that no one regrets having too much pre-assessment data, but they often regret not having them. Like, boy, I wish I would have done this, or boy, I wish I would have gathered info on this. So because, in the end, pre-assessment is going to max maximize your chance of success. You go back to the whole puzzle thing, you know, where everything was kind of jumbled up. These are the things in my mind that make reclamation successful. And you don't, you're not going to be able to do that unless you know what you have before you start. And with that, I'll take any questions.